this is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com as we are taking a look ahead at the Thanksgiving week of games. We got Rivalry Week in college football. We got Thanksgiving across the NFL and some big games on Sunday as well. We're going to break all those down in a Thanksgiving betting preview palooza here as we're jamming everything into one podcast for this week. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as always, by Ed Fang. You can find him over at thepowerrank.com and on Twitter at thepowerrank. Ed, happy Tuesday to you. Happy Thanksgiving week to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. But, Jim, I got to tell you, I think Uh-oh. I'm a bad person. Uh-oh. What's this? So we were sitting around last Saturday, you know, pretty happy after Michigan got the win against Indiana. And then we turned it over to the Cal-Stanford game. Yeah. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, Cal scored a late touchdown to win that game. And so these stoic-faced kids on the the axe committee uh, on both sides, right? Have you seen this? No. Okay, so there's an axe committee because Stanford and Cal play for an axe. Right. And so the axe is 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 on this. Uh, it's kind of you know it's kind of like a, a like a picture frame, and there's an axe yeah. on, it, and that's what they play for. Uh, and at the end of the game, like the axe committees for both schools, like go down to the field and and essentially stare at each other. Yeah. Which is probably one of the most comical things at least that's what my non-stanford and cal friends think it's the most i think it is comical too because you're on this axe committee you're not allowed to watch the end of the game which was quite a good game you're just sitting there like grumpy and staring at the other people on the other axe committee um so my wife's an undergrad there and she swears it's a it's a big deal to be on the axe committee (laughs) seems pretty dumb to me but anyways so you you know cal wins they uncuff the axe and they have to turn it over to uh, from the Stanford people, and they have to turn it over to the Cal people. Yeah. And the Cal people are elated, and and they go running off. And and obviously, as a Stanford person, I'm pretty grumpy. <laughs> but this, but this axe committee, Jim, they're not like athletes. It's not the cross oh, country. No. Team. It's not like people like you who played sports in high school. They look <laughs> like they plucked them straight out of the double E lab. <laughs> and they're sprinting over to the Cal part of, of of wherever their fans are, and I was like, I think they're gonna bite it. And five seconds later, they bit it. <laughs> and I got up and danced. I was so happy that they bit it. Oh, so, my God. I'm a bad person. You know what, Ed, though? That could be way worse because well, we're talking Minnesota, Wisconsin. They play yeah. for a real axe. They play for Paul just, Bunyan's Hey, this axe. is a real axe. It's just on a, you know, like a, like a plaque. There, there's nothing restraining this axe. Um, it's a real axe that can hurt like someone. Some- they don't let some double E's out of the computer lab like hold it though, right? It's like the no, player- no, no. They they let the re- the the like the football players and like I'm always worried about it. And like I grew up in Minnesota, so I have a long a long history of following this rivalry. I remember vividly watching from my parents' basement. There was a game. It was in the Metrodome, and Minnesota was up, and Lou Holtz was talking in the ESPN studio about how. Uh, you know, Minnesota had it locked up, you know, and uh-huh. of course, Wisconsin blocks a punt, returns her for a touchdown, wins, and in a chaotic fashion, runs across the field to the other sideline because Minnesota won the year before. They grab right. the axe. I'm like sobbing because I'm a little kid and I'm upset about this. And they're running <laughs> around the field with this unrestrained axe. And I'm like, yo, 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 something not good's going to happen here. Uh, so like. It's not as it's not as comedic, but it is frightening as what happened. Right. As and like, I feel like that would be hilarious to watch. And predicting it makes it better. But Minnesota yeah. Wisconsin gets real, man. Yeah. Well, Stanford Cal is pretty real too, man. Th- that's true. There's some history there. I've heard a couple a couple things, I suppose, about that rivalry for sure. But I didn't realize they played for an axe. It makes sense, you know, given given the mascot. But like, didn't realize that. That's fun. Wait, why does it make sense given the mascot? Oh, because of the tree. Yeah, but see, that's the comical thing. They've been playing for an axe way oh. longer than the tree, which is actually not Stanford's mascot. It's the Stanford right. Band's mascot. So why so, do they play for an axe then? <laughs> I, I have no idea. Um, but you What know, started I, this axe committee thing? Like, how did that become yeah, a tradition? Yeah, how did you say, hey, undergrads, why don't you not watch the end of the game <laughs> and sit and stare all grumpy-faced 
at yeah. a bunch of dorks from the other school. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, after after that happened, I went up and uh, and and we went out to dinner with my family. Yeah. And then and then my little one was like, "Why do you play for an axe if you're the tree?" <laughs> <laughs> Which is just great from an eight year old. Yeah, that's uh, super funny. I love that. And I, I don't think you're a bad person. I would laugh at that too. I think that is fully valid. Um, right. well, you have validated my life, Jim Sonis. So I'm, yeah, so yeah. I'm going to like uh, expunge you of all... I don't know if that's the right word to use. Whatever. I'm going to do it. Expunge you of all guilt. Uh, Ed Fang, you've been, you've been freed from this conscious chain, and you're good to go. Because right. I would also laugh at that, and it sounds hilarious <laughs> to me. And I want to find video of that after we do this. Today, we are going to jam in uh, both college football and the NFL because of Thanksgiving week, Ed, uh, any big traditions in the Fang household on Thanksgiving? Well, my the rest of my family all left this week, actually. So <laughs> I'm here alone this week, which is actually nice. kind of nice. Yeah. A little bit of quiet. Yeah. Uh, getting some stuff done. And then uh, I'm going to go see my parents later. So no, nothing big. Okay. So less chaos than usual. So you are the opposite of literally everyone else when it comes to Thanksgiving. Well, this is this is rare. This is the first time. Okay. This been, so still. Okay. Nice. We'll enjoy. What about um, you? Um, my sister and her husband uh, live like 45 minutes away, so they're going to come to us. Uh, they have a new cat, and the ne- new cat apparently not well-behaved enough to allow for hosting yet. My fiancé is also very allergic to cats, which would not go well. So uh, they'll be coming up here. My whole family is in Minnesota, so it's kind of weird that just so happens my sister and her husband live 45 minutes away. Right over in Ithaca. So uh works out pretty well. We've done the last couple of years and uh, looking forward to it. And, you know, watching some football, playing some DFS, betting a little bit, you know, what cool. could be better than that? Good. We're going to break down this slate of games here in just one second. But before we do that, want to give you a quick reminder. We're doing this usually twice per week here on Covering the Spread with a college football and an NFL show that will obviously change as the NFL or as the college football calendar switches over. But to make sure you get those podcasts right as they are posted, make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. It can be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, anywhere you find podcasts, you can find us. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, make sure you leave a rating and review because those dudes help us out quite a bit as well. Now, before we dive into this week, got to take a look back at last week at both the college football and the NFL, what went wrong, what went right, and uh, I think last week pretty, pretty good, especially on the NFL side. So let's break that down and then dive into Thanksgiving slate. Covering the past. All right, we'll start things off here on Covering the Past with the college football edition of uh, Covering the Spread. We talked with Ian Cameron at Bobano, and we talked about the Grey Cup and felt bad for Ian because it seemed like the Tiger Cats didn't have their best performance on uh, in that game. He, he was talking on Twitter about the offensive line and defensive line just not showing up. Mentioned the over of 51 points, and it finished at 45. Winnipeg won that one, and uh, it didn't seem like it was all that competitive. So our condolences to Ian for his Tiger Cats coming up short, but uh, it sounded like a good season for them overall. So kudos to them on making it that far. Also talked about the over on 57. The over at 57 for Penn State versus Ohio State. He did get two points of closing line value there. Close at 59, uh, but it did wind up going under there. Ian wanted the under on 45 points for Texas A&M versus Georgia, and that game did go under, so got that one. Just 32 points uh, for Texas A&M Georgia, so under pretty easily there. He wanted Temple plus 10.5 against Cincinnati. Cincinnati Barely scored 10.5 points by themselves. Uh, Temple (laughs) lost by two there, so they covered pretty easily. They were down 15 at one point. Uh, They didn't need to scramble in the fourth quarter, but they did wind up covering pretty easily. So Temple's defense played really well and helped Ian nail that one. Ed, you mentioned the under on Michigan State versus Rutgers, and I think this was a beautiful situation where the process and the results aligned perfectly. You wanted the under on 44 points, and you said it was because you weren't sure Rutgers was going to score— and you didn't think the Michigan State <laughs> offense would score 44 by themselves. Rutgers did not score. Michigan State scored 27. So it, the exact route you had mentioned, it has to feel good knowing that the exact thought process is how things play out. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was nice to get it. It was relatively easy. Um, I, I don't think you can ever expect a team to not score. And, yeah. and Rutgers did have some yards in that game. I think they were, you know, they were about to kick a field goal pretty late in the game gone a penalty and, and decided to punt. So uh, just just another thing to, to help seal the deal there. 
<laughs> Absolutely. You didn't need the help, but it doesn't hurt. That is for yep. sure. So good things across the college uh, slate last week. And the NFL side, we had Donnie Seymour on to preview Week 12. You can find him on Twitter at RightSideVP. Donnie wanted Seattle plus one and a half, and I think... I think Seattle might have been favored by the time that one closed. Uh, I also had the under on the Eagles team total at 24 points, and both those hit a pretty big way. It helped that there was some injury news that broke later in the week with Alshon Jeffrey not playing, Nelson Aguilar not playing, uh, Brandon Brooks had anxiety issues during the game, so he couldn't go. So the Eagles were definitely shorthanded, but I think I don't even know if Brooks had played that full game or if Alshon had played that game, if they had hit, they would have hit. They were they were brutal there for sure. So uh, kudos to Donnie on nailing that one. And that's um, rough against not a good Seattle defense. Jaron Reed got hurt during that game, and they still didn't do anything. And, yeah. like, again, I know, like, I think that, like, I, I think I, for some reason I follow a lot of Philly people on Twitter. Mm-hmm. There have been some, like, wild things about Carson Wentz this week as far as, like, cut him. Like, people oh, have taken geez. this way too far. I thought that. I, like back in like Wentz's first year, I thought that people were getting too excited about him, you know, and stuff. And I don't think the pendulum could have swung anymore where like, yeah, Carson Wentz missed some really bad throws on Sunday. That's true. But you also have to remember the context of, you know, right. guys are not getting open. He is under pressure pretty consistently. And like, it's the same thing with Jared Goff. People are not considering the context. And, I think that people are being too critical of Carson Wentz when you consider the situation around him. It's just wild to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you got to be a little bit patient here. Um, I mean, I think there are some broader questions with this Philadelphia sure. organization. You win the Super sure. Bowl, and they're pretty much disappointed since then. Uh, no longer kind of have the mantle as the you know the most analytic savvy team as well either as as Baltimore uh, has definitely taken that over. Um, but yeah, a lot of questions in Philly. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how they answer those. Yeah. And, uh, people love to overreact to NFL stuff. So I shouldn't be surprised. People well, are people being love, so critical. People love Carson to over- overreact in football, right? Right. Exactly. I mean, in the sense that we have 12 or 16 games to evaluate right. these teams. It's, 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 it's just, it's just naturally geared towards, uh, overreaction. Absolutely. Small samples lend themselves to that. And, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the other game we discussed here was Cowboys against Patriots, and uh, Donnie mentioned the Cowboys plus six and a half. You said your numbers had it at a four and a half point game, and it wound up being a four point game. So, you know, you said that you didn't want to bet it because of Bill Belichick, because of Jason Garrett, and I think that also played itself out weirdly because uh, Jason <laughs> Garrett uh, has an affinity for field goals while he's down uh, seven points. So, you know, I think that I understand the thought process and not betting it despite seeing your numbers there. But, hey, your numbers are right. I think that's good. Uh, but right. maybe your numbers know Jason Garrett doesn't want a gun for a tie game when down seven, potentially. I mean, to the extent that that manifests in the margin of victory in games, maybe. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's more on the side of, of the subjective adjustments afterwards. And, you know, I feel pretty good about staying away from it. Um I think, you know, if, if New England could have had just a little bit of a better game against a pretty bad Dallas defense, yeah. um, it, the margin could have been a lot, could have, could have been bigger and they could have covered that. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, when we talked about it too, it wasn't clear that Mohamed Sanu and Philip Dorsett were both going to miss that game. And if they, if one of right. them had played, we may have seen the Patriots move the ball a lot easier, despite the weather. Uh, so I think that was um, definitely a factor there too. But the numbers are right. So at least that's, that's definitely good there, there we too. go. Uh, Donnie mentioned the Jets Raiders over 46 and a half points. The Jets did their part. That's for sure. Uh, the Raiders <laughs> benched Derek Carr in the third quarter. So, uh, kind of killed Donnie's odds there. I think it was a good process play. Um, I, I like that, that one too. Uh, the wind actually wound up being pretty high and the Jets still scored 34 points. So the results didn't hit there, but I thought the process was good by Donnie. He also had the Browns team total over 27 and a half points and the game over 44 and a half points. Both those are wins as well. We saw Baker Mayfield break out in the first half of that game and Ryan Fitzpatrick moved the ball against the Browns defense. So I think uh, all all around really awesome week by both Ian and Donnie and uh, a really solid week where the process I think played out pretty well. Any final thoughts for you, Ed, from week 12 NFL or week 13 of college football? Yeah, I mean, uh, we got to talk about the Ravens. I mean, they were killing the Rams last night. 
fourth and nine. Uh, there's a penalty on the Rams that gives them an extra four yards. And they pull the punt team, throw the offense back on, convert fourth and four, which is absolute. You should absolutely go for fourth and four in your sure. midfield. They convert, score another touchdown. And as scary as the offense is, it's even scarier when you have a coach that understands the right calls on fourth down. Right. And um, yeah, well, so I, even, I thought that was, I thought that was interesting. Just, they, they've been doing it all year. It's not even just understanding. It's having a coach who is willing to do it. Right. Because like a lot of coaches understand it, I think. And they've talked about this. But they may not actually go through with it. And I think that that's, that's the next level and John Harbaugh has shown that he will follow through on that. Like, he'll listen to what the analytics right. say. And sure. it's so hard. Like, if you grow up your entire life as a football coach being told one thing to be told something else and to act against and to act in favor of that. So I understand why coaches are hesitant. I get it. But to actually go through with that is, is incredible. I also want to talk about the Ravens defense just briefly while we're, while we're talking about them. Ever since the Marcus Peters trade... They've been gross. Um, you look at the per dropback expected points added numbers by quarterbacks against them. Uh, Russell Wilson, negative 0.25. Tom Brady, negative 0.12. Ryan fin- Finley, negative 0.65. Uh, Deshaun Watson, negative 0.41. Jared Goff, negative 0.19. So they've all been negative 0.12 or worse. Tom Brady's been the best. Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson having terrible days. Like Jared Goff was never on the field. They played. They had three snaps in the third quarter, so it was just right. a wild game. Uh, but when you match up an offense that hits a hot streak with a defense that's playing as well as they are, brutal things are going to happen. And we're going to talk more about the Ravens in our preview for this week too, because they're just kind of a wild team at this point, Ed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 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 they're not, you know, historically the, you know, I mean. They're not historically the best team in the NFL right now. They're just they're just on a heater and yeah. and they're they'll they'll settle down at some point. I also and want to mention, I think two weeks ago when I talked about wanting Houston plus four and a half at Ravens or wherever yeah, it was. That was two weeks um, ago. Yep. I had kind of mentioned uh the pass defense and yeah. that PFF grades were really good. Yep. Uh back then their passing success rate after my adjustments for schedule, they were eighteenth. Uh they're up to twelfth now. Yep. Which definitely is uh, confirms what exactly what you were saying. So yeah, everything is working right now. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you want to work in the playoffs. But you know, if you get it a couple months early, then then you go with it. Absolutely. So we'll see how things play out. And we'll talk more about the Ravens in our preview. But before we do that, during Thanksgiving week, we are hooking up our podcast listeners with Number Fire Premium for just $5 in your first month. Whether you're betting on Thanksgiving, setting your DFS lineups, or just uh, ready for the fantasy playoffs, Premium covers all the bases. Normally as much as $49.99, try Premium today for just $5 when you sign up with the promo code TOUCHDOWN. That is promo code TOUCHDOWN. Visit numberfire.com slash premium for more details. Promo code only applies for first-time users through the end of Cyber Monday. Again, numberfire.com slash premium, and that promo code is TOUCHDOWN. Let's dive in now to the Thanksgiving slate and get you set for all the college and NFL action coming up this weekend. Covering the present. All right, no covering the future for today. We're just going to go through nine games. We're going to give our leans on these. We're going to go kind of rapid fire. Normally, we'll, we want to focus on the process, and we're going to give reasons why we think uh, we're leaning different ways in these games or why we're not leaning certain ways. But we're going to go a little bit more rapid fire for today. So, Ed, we're going to start things off here with one, a game that you have may, may have some interest in. That is Ohio State versus Michigan. I call it an A game, but it's actually the game. Ohio State, a nine-point favorite now at FanDuel Sportsbook. The total is 50 and a half. What do you see with this game between Ohio State and Michigan? Yeah, it's been interesting to look at Ohio State's data just from this year. So I, I uh, there's three components to my model, and one of them is just data from this year. So in terms of points, so margin of victory in particular, uh, success rate, and then yards per play. Um, so I take those, I adjust each of them individually for strength of schedule, put them back together in weights that I have found to be appropriate. Ohio State's the best team in the country. And not only the best team in the country, they're three points on a neutral site better than LSU. So They've really been good. Uh, is there some small sample size and uh, regression to the mean coming? Probably. Um, but Ohio State's been that good. Uh, Michigan has also been very good since the second half at Penn State, uh, putting up some big margins of victory and playing like the team that we thought 
uh, they could be heading into the season. Um, but Ohio State is uh, it, it has just been on another level so far. So uh, this is my numbers. My numbers uh, like uh, Ohio State by about 11. This is not a play for me. I think Michigan's yeah. been playing well enough, and it's consistent with what we thought this preseason to stay away from this game. Um, but that's but but it should hopefully it'll be a decent close game. I also this one is a stay away, and part of it's because of Ohio State last week because. You know, they, they were facing Penn State, and Penn State's a good defense. They're ranked 10th in SP+, Plus, according to Bill Connolly on ESPN. Uh, Michigan is 5th, and that was kind of the first year that Ohio State looked really mortal to me, and it made sense. They were play, facing a tough team. Now they're on the road, facing a really tough defense, and I think that that is enough where it's hard for me to feel really good about Ohio State as a 9-point favorite. And the reason I don't want to go towards Michigan is – I think that Shea Patterson's ball security issues frighten me when he's facing a guy like Chase Young. I don't know if that's like rational or no, if no, no, it's no. me overreacting, but like that's a, a major factor for me, and it, it's it scares me to to back Michigan. So I think this is a stay away too. I think the line's very good. Yeah, uh, it's not irrational. Uh, I think someone's done a study showing that uh, a, a big portion of fumbles by the offense occur on like strip sacks. Or yeah. something more because it's just like a play where the quarterback's right. not expecting it. Uh, you can get a strip sack. It tends to be that the offense tend to, tends to recover those more just there, yeah. because there's more offensive players on that side of the line of scrimmage. Um, so there's definitely something uh, to be said there. And, and I think there is some data to back up what you are saying, Jim. All right. So we're both staying away from this one, but it should be a fun game. And I'm excited to see how things play out. I want to see Ohio State, that offense. You know, the defense has proved itself. I, I have no more questions there. But I, I think this offense should be fun to watch against Michigan, too, and see if they can uh, kind of redeem themselves after last week. Let's move now to Alabama versus Auburn. This game, not as fun, I think, as it would have been if Tua were playing, but I think it's more interesting from a betting perspective with no Tua. Alabama, a three-and-a-half-point favorite. The total here is 50. What do you see with this one, Ed? And I think it's it's a complicated game to dissect because yeah. we don't know a lot about Mac Jones. Yeah, we don't know a lot about Mac Jones, but I think the thing that – I don't know if I've talked about it yet this year – but Alabama's defense hasn't been the same this year as in past years. Uh, starting in 2015, in my adjusted yards per play, they were first for three straight seasons. They had a terrible season last year by dropping all the way to third in adjusted <laughs> yards per play. Uh, they're 10th this year uh, by adjusted yards per play. They're worse when I look at adjusted success rate. And, you know, Nick Saban's had his fourth defensive coordinator in five years. And he's had some, you know, serious injuries in the front seven. So that that not, knocks him down a notch. Uh, Auburn's offense is, you know, kind of a work in progress uh, with a true freshman quarterback at Bo Nix. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it's it's going to be an interesting game. My number has Alabama by seven. Uh, it requires an adjustment for Tua. Right. I think the market's pretty fair at Alabama by four. Uh, if I lean any way, I'd probably lean towards Auburn just because of the defense. Uh, yeah. Al the, the, because Auburn's defense is like the best in the nation by my adjusted yards per play. Uh, so that's why I would lean there. And I think that my only lean on this game, I don't want to touch the spread. I think I like the under here. And a lot of it is because of Bo Nix. Um, if you look at what Bo Nix has done against top 50 defenses by SP plus this year, he has 4.9 adjusted yards per attempt, which is really bad. Uh, Alabama 10th by year numbers defensively. So they would certainly qualify as being a top 50 defense. And, it's not like all Bo Nix's fault. You know, he's a, he's a true freshman. He's in the SEC. He's facing a bunch of really tough defenses. So I think this game will be low scoring. I think that the fear of Bo Nix against a good defense is enough where I can't actually bet Auburn plus three and a half. But it's enough where I can go with the under here. Uh, the total's at 50. What do your numbers say about that total? Yeah, I mean, my number has it at 56, but obviously, again, requires a, an adjustment. Um, it's just so hard when you have no idea what Mac Jones is going to give you right. against the best defense in the nation. Well, it, it, how do they compare to Arkansas or against an FCS team? You know, that's, we, that's the same, we have a Mac Jones so far, so we'll learn a yeah. lot about him. Uh, but I think my only lean here would be uh, towards the under on 50 points. Let's finish up here with the battle for Paul Bunyan's axe. It's Wisconsin against Minnesota. Wisconsin, a two and a half point favorite. Total here is 47 and a half. What do you see in this game, Ed? Yeah, I see Wisconsin being clearly the better team. When I look at adjusted success rate, the offense is sixth in the nation. 
Uh, and the defense is even better at, at third in the nation. Uh, as much as I respect how much Minnesota has come on lately, and, and they have been really good. Um, oh, it was interesting uh, in the Northwestern game. Yeah. That because uh, I was going to tweet something snarky like, eh, doesn't it count as a loss if you allow 22 points to, to Northwestern? Yeah. Or whatever it was. Uh, but it was a fascinating game because, like, I think 90 percent of Northwestern's yards came on three long touchdown drives. Yeah. So they score had three long touchdown drives and like essentially zero yards the rest rest of the game, which, um, you know, if you kind of look at their yards, yards per play is a very is very, very strongly correlated with, with how many points you're going to score. Obviously, there's fluctuations. Uh, but if you look at that, they, sh- they should have – Northwestern should have scored fewer points. Yeah. Um, so, anyways, Minnesota has been really good recently. Um, Wisconsin, in my mind, is cl- and in the numbers' mind, is clearly the better team here. Numbers, I think, like Wisconsin by six. Uh, I will take the side on that. Okay. I am actually really into the Minnesota offense. Uh, so, I'm actually going to go the other way with this one. I think I like Minnesota plus two and a half. And – I think it's because I don't see, like, when looking at these two teams, I don't see it as being a big difference. I think that Wisconsin's defense is better, but I like Minnesota's offense more. We talked a lot about Minnesota's defense because they faced a lot of backup quarterbacks. They faced Northwestern's fourth-string quarterback mm-hmm. on Saturday, and he put up 22 oh, points. So Wait, so you what, do you, what do you qualify? What's Hunter Johnson? He's either the third string that got benched? Because he played. I think he's, like, the one-and-a-half string Right. Um, he qualifies as the one and a half string. So, so TJ Green is the only quarterback who has shown life this year. He got hurt against Stanford. Uh, Hunter and he's, Johnson he's been out since then, right? Right, and yeah. then Hunter Johnson kind of uh, Aiden Smith got hurt, hurt. Um, so he got benched. Uh, Hunter Johnson started that game against Minnesota. Andrew Marty came in. He's a two star quarterback who decommitted from Miami, Ohio, to go to Northwestern. He's a redshirt sophomore. Apparently, he's been terrible in practice, so Fitz has, like, refused to play him, uh, but played well in that game. So, like, the Minnesota narrative of facing backup quarterbacks, still very true, but their offense is good. Tanner Morgan right. has played four games against top 50 uh, defenses by SP+. His adjusted yards per attempt in those four games is 12.5, which is nuts. That's right. awesome. Like, that's a really good number. And part of that's because of what you've talked about, where – they do kind of rely on big plays, and big plays can regress in a big way. And they're, I'm assuming their success rate numbers are not as good. But right. when the big plays have been there all year, I still have some faith in this Minnesota offense. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Minnesota plus two and a half. I understand why um, the numbers are not as into Minnesota, but I just, I have less faith in the Wisconsin offense. I guess. All right. Well, so the only way I'm going to be sad about this game is if if Wisconsin wins by one or two points, because if they lose, uh, they will push on the nine wins. Oh, I had at the beginning of the year. I don't think I mentioned it on this show. Yeah. Uh, so I have like two results that are bad for me in this game then. <laughs> so we're just hoping that it's not by one or two points. Yeah. Hey, if right. Minnesota wants to blow them out, I'm all happy for it. Right. <laughs> I'll take an L. I'll take an L for the, you know, for a push on the win total, you know? Absolutely. I, I ho- totally understand that. It, and it's kind of like a hedge, too, because, like, the odds of that being one or two-point game, not that high. So, you know, you might as well be happy regardless outside of those two circumstances. So, Ed has uh, Wisconsin minus two and a half, and I have Minnesota plus two and a half. Let's move now to the, the NFL games. We're going to go through all three Thanksgiving games because – why not? And we're going to go through three games on uh, the weekend as well, starting off with Bears versus Lions. Some big movement here. Uh, the Bears are now two-and-a-half-point favorites. They open at one. The total is 38-and-a-half. And I think that's a reflection of the Bengals' fifth-string wide receiver, Jeff Driscoll, starting at quarterback for the Lions. Uh, what do you see with this game, Ed? Yeah, um, what I do on my site when I have, especially when I have three games, is I look at what the market would make this game based on only the three games that they've judged Jeff Driscoll. And when I do that, it makes the Bears a three-point favorite on the road here. So I think this is a pretty fair line. Uh, Driscoll, Detroit in games that Driscoll has started have a 36% success rate. And to kind of put that in perspective, uh, you know, Mitch Trubisky and the the Bears' raw number has been about forty percent. So it would it, it would be the kind of the worst in the NFL given what we've seen from Driscoll. Obviously, it's a small sample size, um, but uh, yeah, I think I think the line is fair at Bears minus two and a half, uh, and might might even get to three. 
Yeah, I don't I don't want to touch this spread because this game is the weirdest game you could possibly have uh, with Trubisky being broken and Jeff Driscoll <laughs> again. Like, this dude was moved to wide receiver by the Bengals in August and then cut. They kept Ryan Finley, who was old and bad, over, over Jeff Driscoll, and he right. is a starting quarterback. So I can't bet the Lions, but it's also really hard for me to bet on Mitchell Trubisky right now. So... Yep. I don't want to touch this game, honestly. I think it stinks. Um, What's the total? It's 38 and a half. It opened at 39. It's already come down half a point. Um, but, yeah, like like Jeff Driscoll literally got moved to wide receiver it. in August. Yeah. It's Sorry, weird. my number has it at 40, and that probably requires a downward adjustment for, for right. Driscoll. Yeah, so pretty so maybe, efficient lines here. Yeah. I just don't want to watch this game. Like I'm going to schedule <laughs> uh, Thanksgiving dinner during this game. And I think I'm on a plane during this game. Well planned, Ed. Well planned. Although I you think it's, I have a Delta flight, so I could watch it. But I just like this game would be so much better if Matthew Stafford were playing. I hope he gets healthy because like that stinks. He's good. He had an awesome year. Jeff Driscoll, not as good. Let's move to the Bills versus the Cowboys. I actually do like this game. Um, I like this game a lot, honestly. It's really fun. And it's the only third or Thanksgiving game that is not a divisional rematch within the past three or so weeks. And that's part of why I like it. Uh, but what do you see with the Bills versus Cowboys? Cowboys, six and a half point favorites in the total of 45 and a half. Yeah, I mean, Dallas has the best pass offense in the NFL. And uh, then you come in every week and wonder whether they're ever going to throw the ball. <laughs> so... Uh, if they do, they're going to face pretty good Bills defense. Uh, that is sixth. And when I look at success rate on past defense plays, uh, my number has Dallas by 6.3 points. So it's kind of a stay away from me. I like the, the over here. Uh, the over the total's actually risen a, p- a point already. It was 44 and a half. It's 45 and a half now. So I don't like it as much, but I still like it uh, because I think the Bills defense is good. Um, but they've had a really good schedule. Like they faced, and the, your numbers account for that. So, like, it's worth noting that it does account for the fact that they faced some really bad play. But if you go based on number fires metrics, the Bills' defense ranks 20th overall after adjusting for schedule. They're 13th against the pass. They're 28th against the rush. And the Cowboys, I know that we had this perception of them being like this slow team because they always used to be, but despite all the other things that they've done that have been backwards this year, they have been an up-tempo team. They rank third in situation neutral pace, according to Football Outsiders, and the Bills are 16th. Uh, So this is kind of an up-tempo game. It is AFC versus NFC, so non-familiar opponents. They have not just played each other in the past couple of weeks. I like the over here uh, on the total of 45.5. I think I agree with you that the line is pretty efficient because this Bills offense isn't bad. Um you know they've had a, they've benefited from an easy schedule too, uh, but they're not bad. So I think the line is efficient, but I do want the over here. I I think that this game could be kind of fun. It's like my like, it's my favorite game on Thanksgiving slate, which I did not expect going into the year to like the game with Jason <laughs> Garrett and Josh Allen, and suddenly I think it's going to be a fun game. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to have fun watching some Josh Allen. I haven't consumed much Josh Allen this year, but oh, should be buddy. good. <laughs> you are in for a treat. I live in Syracuse, <laughs> which means I'm in the Buffalo market, and I get right. to watch every Bills game. It's a trip. Like, Jameis Winston is interesting to watch because you never know what's going to happen. Josh Allen is is Jameis on roids from, like, a, a watchability perspective <laughs> because, like, he could fumble twice in one play and then throw a pick. Or he could fumble twice one play and then run for a touchdown. The dude's nuts. Right. Like, it's insane. Right. He could throw a pick six, and it would not. you wouldn't bat an eye at it, but, like, it's right. weird. It's, it's going to be a fun game, I think. So it'll be a fun one. Uh, a national audience watching the roller coaster that is Josh Allen should be fun. Let's move now to the Saints at the Falcons. The line here is Saints minus six and a half. The total is 48 and a half. And we did just see this game two weeks ago. That was the game where the Falcons' defense turned it around. Obviously, they regressed in a pretty big way last week. What do you see with this game, Ed? Yeah, I mean, I see New Orleans as a serious Super Bowl contender. Uh, When I look at adjusted success rate, they're fourth on offense, fifth on defense. But I also see a a 6.5 as a pretty big number to cover on the road in the division. Um, My number has it in New Orleans by three. I think I would lean towards them. I don't necessarily love it because Atlanta's defense is terrible, and, and you can see Breeze just destroying them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so I, I think a lean on the side towards uh, Atlanta at home. 
Yeah, I think that for me, more so than the spread, I like the under here. I think I like the under here as much as I like the over for Bills Cowboys. Uh, because there's no Terran Armstead here for the Saints, and he's a left tackle, so no one's going to talk about it. Like We don't like to talk about left tackles, but Terran Armstead is one of the best left tackles in football, and we actually have a sample on this Saints team without Terran Armstead because he's actually missed six games each of the past two years. If you go back to 2018 uh, and look at the numbers on the Quant Edge, the Saints average 8.6 yards per attempt, yards per pass attempt, with Terran Armstead. It fell to 7.4 without him. In 2017, it was 8.8 yards per pass attempt uh, with him, 7.7 without. And that's a pretty major split. And these teams, again, also just saw each other a couple weeks ago. So they know what they're doing. Uh, Drew Brees, his average depth of targets is coming back, is 6.8 yards downfield. Wow. That leads itself to a high completion percentage, which runs the clock. And that's why I want to go towards the under. I still think the Saints win. So I, I agree with you. Like, the Saints are probably going to win. But I think it might be a bit slower and lower scoring than expected. We were talking with Dr. Bob about the effective air yards, and Drew Brees is not throwing it deep right now. And, right. like, it's a small sample. It's three games, whatever. But, like, given the anecdotes around his arm, I think that it's enough where I'm willing to bet the under here. So I think that's that's where I would go. Uh, and you wanted Falcons plus six and a half, correct? Nah, I'll lean that way. All righty, so let's move now to 49ers at Ravens on the Sunday slate. This one's going to be fun, Ed. Um, it's hard for me to get a read on this game. I will be fully yeah. transparent about that. Uh, the Ravens are five-and-a-half-point favorites after their uh, domination on Monday night. Total here is 45-and-a-half. Uh, what do you see with this one? Yeah, you know, like I said, I mean, <laughs> the Ravens are on a heater, and it's it's. I, I'm not going against them. Um, yeah. I don't think it's the right spot to do it, even though my numbers have them winning by about two and a half points. Uh, San Francisco still has the best defense in, in the NFL. Um, you know, I mean, there are problems with this Baltimore team. Like, they can't get much pass rush. Um, and they're, I think their secondary is good. But but Goff, oftentimes in the in the first half, had plenty of time to throw. Um, so there definitely are problems. Um, but in general, this is a stay away game for me. Yeah, I think that I'm going to stay away too. I agree. I think that this these numbers, I, I think it's just hard for me to get a read. It's kind of similar to Bears-Lions. We're like, I have no read. I have no feel for how this game is going to tr play out, so I just want to stay away from it. I do want to mention that Jimmy Garoppolo, I think watching him, he's made some really bad throws recently, but the overall body of work from Jimmy Garoppolo recently has been a lot better than it was earlier in the year. And I think that if you had given me five and a half, on the Ravens, and I knew what the Ravens would do, but I only knew the early season Garoppolo numbers, I probably would have been really excited to bet against the 49ers. But given what Garoppolo did, with no Joe Staley, with George Kittle being out, with Emmanuel Sanders being banged up, that really did change my view of him. And I think that I am higher on Jimmy Garoppolo now than I was. So I don't want to bet the 49ers, but it's enough where I'm not going to bet the Ravens either. I think that He's really been impressive to me. I know that, again, he's had some hideous throws. Hideous throws. And that matters. <laughs> but I, I do think that the overall body work has been a lot better for Garoppolo. Any final thoughts on this game here, Ed, before we move on? Uh, nope. All righty. Let's move on to Patriots versus Texans. Patriots, three and a half point favorites here. The total is 44 and a half. What do you see with this one? Pretty interesting game on both sides, I think. Yeah. I mean, my number is like New England by 2.7 points, so about three. So... In the right neighborhood, probably lean towards Deshaun Watson and and Houston. Although, you know, I mean, Houston on defense is a little bit asymmetric. Um, yeah. In terms of adjusted success rate, they're second against the run, but 19th against the pass. New England is still a team that is smart enough to to throw on on first downs. Yep. So I think they will be able to take advantage of things. So, um, but you know, I mean, the, this offense has struggled, uh, and we'll see if those struggles continue. New England's defense is still lights out, um, so you have to respect them as a Super Bowl contender because of that defense and because of, of Bill Belichick. Uh, but you, you probably are gonna, we'll see if they struggle again uh, like yeah. they did last week. Yeah, I think I want the over in this game at 44 and a half. Um, it's a game being played indoors. It involves the teams ranked 11th and first in situation neutral pace according to Football Outsiders. Patriots are first now, um, which is really interesting because they've. <laughs> I think that they've found a groove offensively by playing up tempo and it's kind of like we haven't seen it 
uh, because they've had all these injuries. But when they've gone up tempo, they've been more efficient than when they weren't. We just have noticed because of the injuries. But they got Isaiah Wynn back, their left tackle last week. He looked good in that game. I think it was noticeable. And Mohamed Sanu apparently almost played last week. Philip Dorsett is in concussion protocol. If they get both those guys back, I think this game easily goes over the total. But I think I have a good enough read on them to assume those two guys are going to be back. And if I assume they're back, I think the over hits here. Uh, Deshaun Watson, I still have a lot of faith in him. Uh, Not enough where I I want to go at the Texans, but I think enough where I want to take the over in this one. So I think that with the Patriots getting healthier, it makes sense to go at the over here at 44 and a half. Uh, And it should be a really fun game. I just think that the Patriots, we've gotten a lot of stink on them because of the past two games. But when you think about the context of all the injuries, uh, some bad weather in both those games too, I think it makes sense to go for the over here at 44 and a half. Let's finish up with the Monday night game. It's the Vikings against the Seahawks, two teams I have had no read on the entire year, Ed. So help me. Uh, What's your thoughts on this game? Well, I mean, I can read Seattle easily. They have an elite quarterback, probably the best in the the league this year, although Lamar's obviously given Russell a little bit of a run for his money. And their defense is terrible. Now, Minnesota, yeah, I have have no no idea. Um, They've kind of been a mystery to me. But, you know, like I actually went back looking at this uh, to try to figure out where we are with Kirk Cousins. You know, he is completing 70% of his passes. Mm -hmm. He's got the third highest passing grade on PFF. And Minnesota is 11th when I look at adjusted success rate. So those are all very good numbers. Maybe not living up to what they're paying him, but but those are good numbers. Uh, and Seattle's defense is bad. So um, I don't know. My number has about Seattle by three. So doesn't see a ton of value. Uh, maybe lean towards Minnesota just based on what we've seen from Cousins. Sure. Do you have any thoughts on the total here at 48 and a half? 48 and a half. Um, I have it about 48 and a half. Okay, so (laughs) the one direction I was tempted to lean was the under at 48 and a half. But I think injuries here kind of scared me off. Jaron Reed, as mentioned, he rolled his ankle in week 12. He's in a walking boot after the game. And their defense has been bad still with him, but it's been better than it was without him, which is not saying a lot because they were really bad uh, before yeah. Jaron Reed came back. Uh, but also Jadavian Clowney is banged up. If they had Jadavian Clowney and Jaron Reed against what is still a shaky Vikings offensive line, especially going on the road, I'd feel good about the under. Uh, but Russell Wilson's facing a Vikings defense that has looked a lot more vulnerable this year than they have in years past. Yep. That makes it hard for me to go there. Tyler Lockett's a week healthier now. Both these teams are very run heavy, which is why I initially was drawn towards the under. Uh, if you look at the two teams, they're 27th and 30th and pass rate on early downs in the first half. So like that to me lends itself <laughs> towards the under, but right. it's not enough for me to actually pull the trigger and go with the right. under. I lean towards the under, but I don't actually want to, you know, fully commit to that one. I think to me, this is more of just a stay away game, but I think I do lean towards the under because of that. Like, it just frustrates me. Like, I think it's like, it's just me getting mad at the Seahawks for running so much when you have Russell freaking Wilson yep. and you just insist on running. Yep. It's frustrating. Well, I mean, I mean, Minnesota too, right? Yeah, they're, no, you're they're, right. They're at the bottom of the league and they're trying to cram the ball. Uh, their rush success rate was not good. I don't know if it was bottom five, but it wasn't, it wasn't good. And uh, yeah, you know, it's not really the same Minnesota defense um, no. that it was two years ago. And I think a lot of those guys are probably getting old and past their prime and we'll see what they, they do also to had that. a bit of a salary cap crunch um i don't think that's fully hit yet uh but like they did lose sheldon richardson who was there last year they're 12th against the pass based on number fires metrics they're not like actively bad but they're nowhere near what they were um yeah. so i understand why the totals of 48 and a half and i think it's just enough where I don't really want to go there. Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games, and you can look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have developed over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is a premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on numberfire or at oddsfire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. That is all we have for this week, Ed. Uh, We covered nine different games, kind of rapid fire. Uh, A couple of, I think, interesting lines there we can potentially take advantage of. But overall, it's going to be a fun week of football. I'm pretty excited to see how things play out this week. Absolutely. Yeah, it should be good. And with an extra full day on Thursday, 
uh, it'll be fun. Absolutely. Uh, what do you have over at the Power Rank for this week, given kind of a weird week uh, from a yeah. content perspective? Yeah, uh, on the Football Analytics Show, uh, I talked about some college football games, essentially the three that we mentioned today. Okay. Went, <laughs> went a little bit more depth. Uh, but I also went through three of my recommendations, like my non-football recommendations for, for part of the year. Um, so probably most worth it to, I guess, check that out. I don't know. I have a lot of fun asking guests about non-football <laughs> and sports. So. Um, yeah, have that going on, and um, we'll be back uh, next week with more newsletter and uh, and podcast. Outstanding. You can find that by searching for the Football Analytics Show. Find Ed's work over at thepowerrank.com and find Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. Ed, happy Thanksgiving to you. We'll talk to you again happy next Thanksgiving. week. Yeah, sounds good. Absolutely. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. Busy podcast week this week on the DFS side. We had our recap of week 12 up yesterday. Our Thanksgiving slate preview went up today. And our week 13 main slate preview goes up tomorrow. You can find that by searching for the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you remember to subscribe to Covering the Spread as well. Back at you again with our regular two shows next week. So subscribe to Covering the Spread, rate and review the podcast as well. Well, big thank you to those of you who have done so already. Shout out to Calvin Theobald, our video editor, because Cal's with me today for the DFS show. He was with me today for a waiver wire Q&A. He is with us today for this. Cal will be with me tomorrow again for the DFS show. Thank you, Cal, for the crazy hustle you've had this entire week. Really do appreciate it, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully, Thanksgiving goes well for you. Hopefully, you have safe travels. And hopefully, the games go in your favor for both college football and the NFL as well. We'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> 